Yep, I need you to count to five. Please count to five. Me? You! <laughs> you, got me. One, two, three, four, and fifth. Yep, that sounds good. Okay. okay I'm rolling and recording now. Okay, Marianne, first thing I need you to do is um, I'm going to ask you what your name is and uh, where you live and where you grew up. So tell us your name, where you live now, and where <coughs> you grew up. I, <coughs> I'm Marianne Worry. Lair. I was born six miles north of Lair. And I guess after having a lengthy career in teaching, I'm right back in Lair, only this time three miles north of Lair. But we also own my grandfather's homestead, which is where I was born. And so it's just wonderful to be involved with both farms and to know that all this was established in 1898. So I guess that's a, a joy for me. I really appreciate it. Now, how long were you um, living on the farm, doing farm activities before you went off to school to become a teacher? I suppose I was born in 39 and, and I graduated from high school in 57. So I guess my entire life, and of course, in the summertime, I was right back at the farm. I dearly loved the farm. I loved the seclusion, uh, the quiet, the peace. The I mean, I'm definitely a farm girl. I did love my teaching career. It was wonderful. I uh, can't say anything but the best. But uh, farm is the only place to live, in my opinion, <laughs> that is. Why don't you tell us about growing up as a young girl and even, even as into a teenager? What sort of activities, what were your chores like on the farm? Oh boy, where do I start? I guess <laughs> getting the eggs and trying to uh, sidestep the clucks because they'd like to pick on you. So I got smart enough to where I got my foot up into the nest and I would hold their head back and then I'd swipe the eggs. And then of course we also had the clucks where we had a cage and then my mother would uh, trap the clucks in this cage with water and food and that's where they had to stay till they got over their uh, style of being a cluck. <laughs> that was always a big deal. And so uh, the other thing that I did an awful lot of is uh, we had geese. Oh, I'll tell you those geese were just the worst. You know, the gander would love to chase you and of course I was just a little girl at that time and my dad got so disgusted with me being a uh, oh, what should I say, a chicken? <laughs> but uh, one day he just said, you know, you're going you're gonna to sit on this darn gander until you get over being so foolish. And so that was probably the thing I liked the least for geese. And then my job was every night to try to put the geese in. And of course, the minute they got to the door, one would take a beeline for the other way. And after about my fifth attempt, I'd finally go up to the house and I'd be just madder than a hornet because I didn't get the geese in again. And of course, then there were the daily jobs of when my when we got little chickens in the spring of the year. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then that was my job to take care of the baby chickens. So I'd have to clean that chicken coop, you know, three times a week take out all the old straw, put in all new straw, be sure it was swept clean, uh, swoosh all the chickens to one side and then clean this, then put them to the other side, then clean that. So that was a, a, a three time a week project. And I used to hate to do that because it would be hot days. And uh, so I would kind of, you know, just be goofy and horse around and not want to do it. So in German, my mother would say, you do it right away then you're free all day and you don't have to worry about it anymore. And I think to this day, I live by that philosophy. If you know you got to do it, do it. <laughs> and then, of course, there was the big chicken coop. And that was every Thursday. So we had to put up the roosts, scrape everything out of the chicken coop, put lime in all the nests, take all the hay out of the nest, put lime in, put in fresh hay, and we many, many times, my mother was so concerned about uh, the older hens having lice, so we had to put kerosene in all the corners. So those were all the projects that I did all the time. And then, of course, there was the washing the separator. And anybody that knows what a separator is like, they were separate disks. 
on this big stand and you had to wash each one separately and then we would use a, a bit of Hilux. And these discs on the separator had to be in order or they wouldn't separate the cream from the milk properly. <laughs> so that was uh, a chore that I got into all the time. And of course, the separator shed had to be scrubbed and we had a curtain in it and we had a table and and everything had to be, we had one of those coil heaters. This was in later years, of course. We did buy a huge uh, power plant in 1947. So from that day on, we had electricity. So then we had one of these donut heaters that you would put into a pail and the water would be really hot. So after we washed all the discs for the separator, then we dip it in this boiling hot water, hang it on the wall with a clean dish towel. And then, of course, we'd save all the water that we used for washing the separator, and we would soak all the ground oats and pour all the leftover water into the ground oats, and that would be the feed for the pigs. And that was usually hilarious because you had to have the biggest strap or whatever to try to get the pigs away so you could get close to the trough to feed them. <laughs> that was just always a nightmare. I mean, they were definitely pigs, quotation marks, you know. So those are all the things I did. Of course, what I enjoyed the very most was being with my dad. I get all the uh, combine filled with gas. I would get the tractor filled with gas. Uh, I'd get to clean all the trucks. And I just felt 10 feet tall to be able to be with my dad, you know. And then, of course, I also worked in the kitchen, and of course, in the garden, picking all the millions of beans, the cucumbers. I don't think I missed anything. And of course, there was cow milking time. Oh, my word. And in June, with all the fresh grass, you can imagine what color your hair would be. And it would be just a nightmare milking in June. And of course, it went on other months, too, anytime the grass was very lush. <laughs> hey, was... Could you just tell us um, what the different crops and everything were on your farm when you were growing up? Definitely. We had oats and barley, and flax, and wheat. And how about livestock? Oh yes, and we had the milk cows and we had stock cattle. And of course with the milk cows, we, you know, you'd get the cows early and you'd let them stand out in front of the barn so they would get all emptied out or whatever quotation marks. <laughs> and then every cow knew where their stall and so of course, and then later we got smart. We got clamps to put on their tails so they couldn't swish them in your face. And then, of course, we had the barn doors on each side, and you could open that up, and there would be a nice breeze going through there. And, of course, there was the fun of feeding the cats as you were milking, unless your mother caught you. And then, of course, the cats would be washing their face for the rest of the day from the milk all over their face. And it was, I don't know, I'd always enjoyed it. And, of course, then there was cleaning out the barn and sweeping the barn and it was it was a fairly new barn it was built in my uh, younger years and I imagine in the mid early mid 40s so I remember that really well how did you find time to go to school with all these chores <laughs> and in those years you didn't know any better you just did what you were told and there were no questions asked I mean, I don't know. I just... Uh, so did you have, like, get up real early in the morning? You have to stay up late at night? Uh, well, never. You know, in the wintertime, it got dark early, of course. So, And uh, my folks were home, so they'd do a lot of those things. And so, no. And in the morning, of course, yes, you had to get up early to do anything you were supposed to do before you like, went to school. And I was only a mile from school. So I'd usually walk to school then, which I dearly loved to do. And, but since I was such a chicken, I would always carry a hoe with me because I was deathly afraid of snakes. Not that I'd ever killed one, but just the sight of seeing one. <laughs> so I just had all these crazy little stipulations. And country school was awesome. We were a family. And I think that's where peer teaching originated, actually. Because, you know, when I was in first or second or third grade, uh, the fifth graders would check your spelling. They'd probably check your math or whatever the case was. And so we always had, you know, now peer teaching is a big deal. But if I look back to country school days, that was what we did all the time. The older kids would always be helping the younger ones because the teacher, of course, had one through eight. We probably didn't have many students, but nevertheless, she still had to prepare for each one of those grades. <laughs> so 
uh, I, that, that was the beginning of peer teaching. And then, of course, country school was an awful lot of fun. We'd play fox and goose in the winter, in the winter time. That was so much fun. Take our sleds to school and go sledding at noon hour. And noon hour then was an hour. And, of course, then we had our recesses. And uh, I don't know, I just enjoy anything in the country, I guess. Did, did you have brothers and sisters? I had one sister that was 11 years older. So was she a little bit too old to be a playmate? Definitely. She uh, graduated from high school in 45. And I started the first grade in 45, 46. <laughs> so, but I had a lot of cousins that were born the same year I was, so... We, we were together a lot. In fact, we still are together a lot. Well, you were born during the war years, so did you notice any difference on the farm between when you were very young to a little bit older as far as being during World War II or after World War II? I don't, I can't really say that because I know uh, my dad had a 42 pickup that he bought in the black market during World War II. And since he was a farmer, he was able to get a pickup. And then there was also the gas rationing. I have all the tokens. And, and what was so interesting, on the ga gas coupons, there would be one for my sister, and even as I was a child. So uh, for all the children and the parents, we would get gas tickets, and then we also got little tokens. And, of course, as I grew older, that gas rationing became, you know, came to an end, of course. But uh, otherwise, I guess, food-wise, we never had any shortage of any type. I mean, there was the 100 pounds of flour and the 100 pounds of sugar and all the chicken that my mother canned. And at that time, there was no freezer, of course. And so she canned everything we had. And then, of course, we also, <clears throat> excuse me, in the summertime, when she butchered, uh, we had no freezer, no refrigerator, of course. I think we got a refrigerator probably in 46. And it was a Cervelle, a kerosene refrigerator. And can you imagine we had ice cubes for the first time, and my dad insisted on lemonade. It had to be lemons, not none of this Kool-Aid, none of this. So after we got that Cervell refrigerator, we always had ice cubes. But prior to that, let's get back to that, uh, we had a bar across the well. You opened up the well just like a door. And there was a bar across there. And then there was a rope connected and a pail, and a rope and a pail, and a rope and a pail, and a rope and a pail. <laughs> so probably in the first pail, my mother would put in the cream to make butter. And the next one, she'd probably put the fresh chickens she just butchered for tomorrow. And then, of course, there'd be one for Jello. and I mean, on down the line. So that was our refrigerator before 46. But that Cervell refrigerator was pretty nifty. And then, and now let's see, that was in 47 that my dad bought this huge power plant. And then the barn had power, the chicken coop had power, the feed shed. I mean, everything had, was wired. And then in 50, we got... Uh, Rural Electric, you know, Chem Electric at that time, I guess still is. And so, of course, we had been wired. So that really, you know, saved everybody's life. We uh, didn't have to use the windmill or uh, pump the water. Everything was electrified. <laughs> so did you notice as a kid the difference? Well, it was so nice uh, to be able to go to the hay mound in the wintertime and have a light up there because you didn't want to take a kerosene lamp up there <laughs> into the hayloft. <laughs> and it was so nice, you know, if, if, was, if we didn't get uh, back, if we had gone someplace, you could get the eggs in the dark, because now we had electricity. Uh, it was, it was uh, quite an adventure. Oh, and that we got rid of the flat irons, or the sad irons, because we could now iron with electricity. That was amazing. Otherwise, we had those three irons on the stove, and you would keep clicking one on until that was cold and you'd iron, and then you'd click on the next till that was cold and put them all back on the stove, so that we always had a hot iron. But in 47, we had an electric iron. Can you believe that? Did you have to do a lot of laundry stuff? <laughs> oh, I love to do laundry. Yes, and that was before we had electricity, of course. <clears throat> My mother had a, a gas engine wash machine. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, you would... Uh, push it with your foot like you would a motorcycle. 
and it would be real loud. You couldn't hear yourself think throughout the whole yard. And then they put a hole into the summer kitchen to run out the exhaust, and the whole yard would be blue, I swear. And so she washed with the, you know, the gas engine. And that was always fun because we would have two tubs and then you would wash, you know, you'd sort all the wash, of course. You'd do the, the first thing you did was the dish towels and then you would do the bedding and you'd go on down the line from uh, dish towels to bedding to the light colored to the dark colored to the overalls uh, and then to the rugs. <laughs> and everything got rinsed twice. And in the last rinse, my mother would always add bluing. Uh, bluing, I don't know, kind of clarified the water. And if there were any whites in the wash, it would give them such a delightful light color. And uh, so I, I really enjoyed washing. It was just always fun. It was wash day was a delight, especially when we got rid of the gas engine. <laughs> because <laughs> that was not cooking. I know you're, you're a good cook. I know you're a wonderful baker. Um, how did that get started? And um, then maybe tell us about uh, using those skills to help around the farm with serving uh, people during harvesting, those sort of events. Just tell me how to get my, uh, it started in cooking. Well, I guess I just always liked it. But I mean, anything out at the farm is anything I liked, of course. But uh, I just would watch mom. And then when mom would make a pie, she... I had my own little rolling pin and my own little pie plate, and she'd let me roll out my own pie crust, you know. And and if she'd bake cookies, you know, I got a, a set aside a portion of the dough that would be for me, and and I just I liked doing it, and and I always felt so smart when I could be doing something clever like that, and that's how I learned all the German cooking and all the meat and everything. I usually had to have my nose into everything. It made no difference if it was out with the tractor and the combine or if it was in the house. I always liked anything that kept me busy. <laughs> I just, I didn't like laying around. Tell us about cooking for the, the, the crews during um, different farming seasons. Did you have to, you and your mom have to provide meals? To, uh, to oh, cook? heavens yes. Uh, first of all, many times she would butcher the chickens the night before during harvest and we'd hang them in the well. But on a rare occasion, she'd butcher them that morning. Of course, you know, cut the heads off and all the good stuff and get them all ready. And then, of course, she would end up uh, frying them and then baking them. And this was a cold stove at that time. Or not, I couldn't, shouldn't say a cold stove. It was a range. You burned wood or cow chips or whatever. And that was before we had electricity. <clears throat> and then, of course, there were all the pies. And that, of course, to this day, as my aunt would say, if you spell it P-I-E, it's got to be good. And I, I just fell into all of it, I guess. And then I learned how to make all the strudels and the dumplings. And, and of course, my job was to have my nose into everything and set the table and get everything ready. And all the thrashers would then come in to eat at noon. And it usually would be right at noon because then at 3 or 4 in the afternoon, whatever was available, my dad had a 28 Ford. And so that's how we would take lunch out to the field for the guys then. And they, of course, had the Ford pickup. But uh, anyway, that was always a lot of fun. And then Mom would take kuha out and cookies and anything that, and sandwiches, of course. You couldn't really take pie out, to the, out for the men because <laughs> we didn't take any dishes, you know. It was grab your sandwiches, grab your kuha, grab your cookie or whatever. And then we always had these large jugs, glass jugs, and of course, at that time, there was no ice. Our well had very cold water. So then mom would fill these jugs with water, and then she would tie gunny sacks around these uh, jugs. And she would use safety pins to make sure that the gunny sacks stayed at, uh, attached. And then she would dip those gunny sacks, those jugs with the gunny sacks around, into the tank. And so those sacks would be all wet and so then every crew had their own jug of water, which was saturated with these gunny sacks so it would stay cool. That was always kind of interesting to do. I got to fill the jugs, but then mom would pin on the gunny sacks and dip them in the water and away we would go. How many meals a day would you be providing? Uh, dinner and lunch. Usually by supper time, and that was in, you know, during thrashing days, uh, many times it would not include the evening meal 
because by then everybody was so half dead they wanted to go home. <laughs> so usually it was not the evening meal. Who would have been uh, working at Threshing? Would it be uh, local guys? Or? Well, what my dad did is he had a fancy tractor at that time. He bought the tractor in April of 39, and I was born in July of 39. It was a W9 International Harvester. And he had a, a good thrashing machine. So he would move to all these different farms. And as he moved to one farm, then those guys were all drafted to help, plus my dad had a hired man. Then they'd move to the next farm. They would take everybody along from this farm to the next farm. Then they would take everybody along from that farm to the next farm. So he moved to about four or five different farmers in, in the fall of the year. And the crew continued you know, hauling the bundles and everything for the thrashing machine. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, so he kind of was in the business of thrashing for other people. Did, uh, were, were your farms, growing up, were your farms successful? Ours was very. I, I can't ever remember a time that we didn't have everything we ever wanted or needed. I don't know if it was the management of my father, but uh, as a kid, I remember at Christmas time, he would order all these chocolate-covered nuts from Sears, and everything would be ordered from Sears. We got these huge, long boxes of all the delicacies, the smoked oysters and all that type of thing, and all the different cheeses. So I, I was really, I can't remember that we were ever limited. So your, your sister was a, a lot older than you. Yes. Did she stay in farming or did she do something else? No, she stayed in farming her entire life. She did not appreciate the farm. She strictly tried to stay in the house on every occasion. And of course, I was daddy's girl and I had to be wherever he was and whatever was going on. But my sister did not appreciate farming. In fact, she detested it. <laughs> but she married a farmer, so she ended up staying at the farm. But uh, no, I, to this day, I know when my folks moved to town, I wouldn't move to town with them. I stayed out at the farm with my sister and my, her husband because uh, town was way too boring for me. So you have this uh, farm passion. Yes. I think that's easy to say. Uh, so why did you become a teacher then? Well, when you get out of high school, what are you going to do? And of course, I wanted to do something with my life, but that really never stopped us from farming. I went to college, and then we started teaching. But yet every summer, we'd be at the farm. And then my dad bought this farm in 1963. And of course, by then, my husband and I were both teaching. So we always spent our summers here. We farmed here and up at the other farm, and my brother-in-law and Eugene farmed together. And so it was kind of a, a family affair. Did you Have you always stayed, uh, I guess, as versatile in the farming business as you started? You wanted to know about the tractors, you wanted to know about all the crops. So when you were doing this even part-time and now, do uh, you still have your hand in everything? Well, well, they like to go check the fields. I like to go along, and I like to see, you know, what progress is we made or how dry the dirt is. I always have to feel that, and I guess I like the smell of earth. <laughs> just, and, of course, with my vision being somewhat impaired, quotation marks, somewhat, I uh, still will take the diesel truck out for them or I'll take the service truck out for them. Mom, come and get me. I ran out of gas. Uh, uh, Mom, uh, bring out some water and some lunch. I'm in this field now. And so I'm, I'm usually, and of course I don't have to go on the road because our land is pretty much from one farm to the other. So I never have to go on the road. And I haven't hit a rock pile or anything yet either. So, <laughs> But yes, I'm totally involved. Do you think that the women's uh, role on farms have changed over the years since you were a kid? Well, uh, there again, that's a difficult question to answer. Some women are really into it. I mean, they do everything that the husband does. I mean, they help with the cattle, the vaccination. And I used to combine, too, until my vision, you know. But... Uh, 
And then there's, of course, the housewife that only wants to be in her fancy kitchen, and that's about all she wants to do. But uh, there are some families that are the woman is totally involved. In fact, they're co-partners. I know we have some around here where the women are totally involved with farming. Do you think it's a good career for, for a woman to go into? I don't see what it could hurt. I mean, I think it's just wonderful to be knowledgeable of all the different seeds, all the different sprays, and the horrendous change in all the equipment. I mean, to be on top of that must be, you know, just wonderful. But like I said, with my vision, it kind of limits me. But I know uh, some people in town where the husband and wife do all the farming and she doesn't miss a beat. Do you think that, that you're an advocate for, for farming? Do you think that um, you know, if someone came to you and asked you about farming that you would uh, uh, be very encouraging about becoming a farmer? Definitely, definitely. The, there is no life that is more satisfying or more wonderful than to be in the country and basically be your own boss. And uh, if you don't want to get up at 6 that day, you don't have to answer to anybody. You might want to get up at 7.30. And in all the years I was in teaching, of course, I was, which I dearly loved. And I, I have such good feedback from former students. Even when I started teaching in 59, I, you know, get um, Christmas cards, birth announcements, uh, whatever. And I mean, I, I dearly loved that phase of it, but yet every summer we'd be back at the farm. And of course at nights too, we'd be driving from Lenton to the farm to work. We were always involved in farming and I loved it. Let's talk a little bit about your heritage. Um, maybe you just tell us a little bit about your heritage and how that might have shaped your life and, and maybe uh, even some things you've done in agriculture. Okay. Uh, my mother was born in 05 in Bessarabia, South Russia, <clears throat> and they came to America in 11. They lived nine miles south of Lair. <clears throat> and of course, she was the oldest girl in the family, so she was in charge of everything. She was not able to go to school more than fifth grade at the most because her mother was rather ill. So she did learned all the cooking and washing and skills and everything. And I guess that's probably the way I was reared also. And my dad, of course, grew up six miles north of Lair. And he was always involved in farming. And in, in his early 20s, he did go to California and, and ran heavy-duty equipment in Victorville, California. But, of course, I have all my folks' letters that they wrote to each other in that early 20s and uh, so I guess my dad yearned to get back here and then my folks were married in 24 and uh, so they moved to the North Farm and they lived in the summer kitchen which was their honeymoon cottage and my grandparents lived in the big house so that was I don't know I, wherever I turned I guess I was always involved in farming where were, you, where were you actually born? Which house? Six. Uh, my grandfather's homestead, exactly six miles north. And that's where the summer kids at. And that's where the summer kids at. Mm -hmm. I thought you might have been born, actually born in the summer kids. No. By then, folks lived in the big house, and Grandpa moved to Idaho. <laughs> Is there anything else about agriculture, since that's what we're talking about, that you'd like to share with us? Well, I can't think of anything offhand that uh, it was just always fun I just enjoyed everything I uh, oh I oh we had what we called the Pashton that was a lot of fun Wait, tell me about that. the Pashton yeah oh that was so much fun every oh when we were almost done seeding and then if we had the pickup or whatever we had we'd all go out out into some field my dad designated which would be a good place to start this huge garden. But it was called the Pashton because we didn't really plant anything out there but potatoes and corn and melons and watermelons. I mean, cantaloupe and watermelons. And uh, <clears throat> so that was just... Uh, and then, of course, there would be the times when you'd have to go out to the Pashton and pick uh, potato beetles. So you would have this five-gallon pail 
and at the bottom of the five gallon pail you probably have two inches of kerosene. So you would walk up to every potato plant and you would shake it and they'd all fall, all the potato beetles would fall in there. And of course they would demolish a potato plant in just minutes there'd be nothing left but a stick. So it would be the hottest day of the year and <laughs> you'd be out there picking potato beetles. <laughs> you'd also be hoeing all the potatoes and of course we had the pumpkins, the cantaloupe and the watermelon out in the pastan too. And that was always so much fun. In the fall of the year, we had these little honeydew, or not honeydew, what were they called? Watermelon uh, sh sugar daddies or whatever. They had ordered them from Gurney's. And they would be, oh, about twice the size of a goose egg. And, uh, and then my dad would take the jackknife and he'd cut out a perfect little square to see if it was ripe enough. And then he'd put it back in and then we'd have to wait a few more days till it was ripe enough. But uh, we always had a pashtan. In fact, David, this year, our son, put out a pashtan out in the middle of the field. <laughs> oh, in the middle of the field? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, some chosen place, you know. Uh, it usually would be at a different place just about every year. And uh, this year he put it in with the sweet corn. So it's on this edge. It's just north of here. And so I gave him a whole... Uh, Oh, I suppose a half a gallon of pumpkin seeds all mixed up. And they do so well out in the field. So you can be go out and keep an eye on it? Well, yeah, we always go out there and, you know, pull up weeds and whatever else. And it's fun. Because you have a garden in the back. Too, yes, right? yes. You probably went to some of that. Too. Right. But uh, this is strictly, you know, like all the corn. And, you know, you can't put very many potatoes in the garden. But out at the, at the Pashtan we would have enough potatoes that would last for the winter and enough for seed for the next year. But here, you know, you can't really put more than about 12 potatoes into a garden because you've got all the other vegetables. But out in the fields, you could just go hog wild and plant that much corn too, so you'd have corn for all the neighbors and everybody else. <laughs> so it would, it would be for potatoes and, and, and melons of all sorts? Yeah, and, and, and corn, yep, always. And it's for the family. Yes, uh -huh. because you couldn't, you know, I would never have room to plant corn here or potatoes. So you would go out to the field someplace and you would choose a large area. And of course, when I was a child, my dad would just take the plow and he would plow a furrow. Then you'd plant all the potatoes. Then he'd make the next round and plow that shut. And then you put the potatoes into that and then he'd plow that shut. So that's how we planted potatoes then. Where now, of course, you just dig a hole and put in your potatoes. But that's how we always planted potatoes in the field. It was a lot of fun. So, anything else? I think well, like I said, I just uh, loved my farming. And we were so fortunate that we were able to farm and teach. Because at nights, during harvest time, we'd leave school and come over here to combine. Did you think you you were unusual in that you were able to do that, or were other couples doing the same same thing back in the fifties? Oh, uh, not really. But like I said, uh, Eugene liked farming also, and so that's just something that we was in our blood, I guess. <laughs> and he grew up on a farm also, and and so, and then of course we were also into cattle. Uh, earlier on and that was always a nightmare though because you know we'd have to come over at night to check the cattle and and when my dad was of still good health of course they would check the calves and knowing when a cow would have a calf or something we'd come over that night to make sure that everything would be in order of course we'd sleep on the floor in here on the coveralls to keep checking the calves during calving time and then We'd get up early the next morning and drive back to Linton and take a shower and go to school. <laughs> so I was always involved. Do you think that, um, oh, in the 50s or so, that it was um, women were encouraged, women that grew up on farms were encouraged to become teachers? Is that something that was? I wouldn't say so. In fact, when I went to college, I didn't even know what I wanted to do or be. But I knew I wanted to go to college because I wanted a profession of my own. And so, you know, the first year or so, you just start taking general classes anyway, regardless. And so as the time went on, I then I ended up student teaching, and I really fell in love with that. And 
So that's how it progressed. And then I also had the privilege of going to school at uh, uh, Greeley, Colorado, and that their emphasis was on reading. And so I got to work on reading projects in Denver and with the Houghton Mifflin Reading Company. And that was a tremendous experience. And then we went on to college at the University of Mississippi at Old Miss. And there I worked for the University of Mississippi Reading Clinic, which I really was another upper for me. I mean, it really broadened my horizon on teaching of reading. So and that was the only year we weren't at the farm because we were at Mississippi for an academic year and a summer. But uh, otherwise, we were always here every summer. And well, like now, too, we come here in, uh, well, this year it was later because we had Christmas for Easter this year, as you remember. <laughs> and uh, so we were later this year, but usually we'll come the end of March, mid-March, depending on the winter. And then we will, <clears throat> of course, uh, stay here until we're done combining. And our son, David, is now into uh, sunflowers. So, of course, we didn't get done with sunflowers till like, I think, the first week or second week in November. So uh, we got to stay at the farm a little bit longer this year, which I really like. So you do sunflowers again? Oh, yes, he did them again. <laughs> so he uh, likes to, you know, well, he does a lot of beans and sunflowers and wheat and flax. In my day, of course, we had cattle, so my dad always seeded oats. I was wondering, when you were in high school and you were graduating and you decided to go to college, was it unusual for a woman to be going to college at that time? I wouldn't say so at all, because I take a look at some of my classmates. Uh, I have to think really hard, you know. I would say the majority of the class of 1957, which is so popular because there's a song written for 1957 class, of, the class of 1957. And uh, no, I wouldn't say that at all because, I mean, I can think of three or four of the girls that went to college. And then, of course, a lot of the guys went to college and we all went to Allendale the first year. So you might say the class of 57, with the exception of about three or four, all went to Allendale. Some stayed probably only a quarter. College was at quarters at that time. But uh, I guess I just, I went there to get an education and be uh, independent and make my own career. Were your parents encouraging of that? Oh, extremely. My dad had gone to high school through quarters correspondence. And then, of course, uh, I had such a wonderful childhood. And when I was in second grade, my folks went to Texas for the winter. And I got to go to second grade in Austin, Texas. We'd leave in November and then come back in March. And then when I was, and my cousin was down there and he was in the same class that I was. And then in uh, third grade, we went to Greeley, Colorado and I uh, went to school in third grade in Greeley, Colorado. Of course, this is a real eye-opener. We got our milk in little glass bottles, and wow. I mean, it's <laughs> different than taking your lunch to school, you know. And uh, then my dad would always go to a, a college then in the wintertime. And then the next year, we moved to Nampa, Idaho. We would rent motels that had a kitchenette. And so he would go to school, and I would go to school, and... And, of course, we had relatives there, so Mom would always be involved with everything that they were doing. So he was very interested in higher education. Oh, heavens, yes. And then in the mid-50s, he started teaching country school, my dad. And he was, I mean, just, there wasn't the magazine he didn't get. I mean, I, my entire life, we got the Fargo form. Uh, he got the Cornet, uh, the Reader's Digest, uh, Field and Stream and Outdoor Life and, <laughs> and Look and Life. I mean, he was a reading addict. <laughs> and, and then in fifth grade, I got to go to school in uh, Lodi, California. And that was quite an experience because my girlfriend now lives in Lodi, and I went to the Lincoln School in Lodi at that time. And so they completely redid this. And the, uh, the, the classrooms were around the edge, and in the inside was 
a court of grass and benches. And so they completely refurbished that Lincoln School that I went to and uh, she mailed pictures to me of what it looks like now. So my dad was into education every day of his life. He had a library that didn't stop. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just one lucky gal all the way around to have so many privileges. It was, and I loved country school though. That was just. Do you think, uh, just one last thing, just curious, do you think that you have sister that's 11 years older, she seems very different than you. Have you ever wondered why that is? Well, I don't know. I guess in college we took a class in birth order. And if there's more than seven years between a child, they consider us both firstborn. And of course, I, I don't know. Uh, Adeline just, uh, she wanted to do what she wanted to do when she wanted to do it. <laughs> and with me, I just, my dad bought a piano for her. She wouldn't take lessons, but I started taking lessons when I was six years old. <laughs> And I, and I gave lessons, too, for many years. And, and my dad would eventually say to me, aren't you going to quit? I'd like to listen to the news. And, of course, many kids, you need a, you know, a, a big paddle or a shotgun to make them practice. My dad could never get me to stop practicing. <laughs> so, Where did I see your piano? Your piano in the summer house? Or you... No, I, since I lost my vision... Yeah. I have all the beautiful sheet music of Patty Page and uh, oh, yeah. and uh, Hank Williams Sr. and I mean Pat Boone. I have all those beautiful sheet music, but I gave it away. Yeah. It was so frustrating. Yeah. And then I think of all the lessons, the years I gave lessons also, and it was just, I guess it was just best that I got rid of it because. Do you think if you sat at the piano today you could play? Yes, and I'll tell you why. I had the most wonderful music teacher in the world. We had to memorize a song a week and from the hymn note. And if we memorized a sheet music, which was three, four pages, then we'd probably have four weeks. So to this day, I can still play a lot of the things that I memorized. And my dad used to say, what you learn when you're young will stay with you. And I definitely understand that now because I don't think I could memorize anything now. <laughs> but at that stage in my life, Mrs. Stockberger had us memorize something every week. You mentioned the hymnal. How, how important was as church and religion when you were growing up? Well, I guess it wasn't ever overboard. I mean, we'd you know we'd go to Sunday school if we were around, and we'd go to church, but it was never a big issue. It was I, a real central part of, of some families. I mean, it's it's like the king kingpin of 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 their family. You know, growing up, mm -hmm. is, is the church. Well, we'd go to Sunday school and, <clears throat> excuse me, and yeah. then uh, we'd go to church. But, I mean, if we were gone, so be it. I mean, it's just like when I was, oh, I suppose six or seven, my dad would go to the resorts in Minnesota. And we'd stay there for a week at a time. And we'd go fishing. And at that time, there were no refrigerators. So we had the ice boxes. That was really a lot of fun. And then I had two cousins that were one year older and one year younger than I am. So us three girls, I was my dad's brother. And then the whole family would go like to Lake Lida in, in uh, Minnesota, fishing for a week or so. And uh, I mean, I just, I just had privileges that never stopped. Your, your dad, besides being in education, once again, he must have been successful because you are able to do a lot of things that kids around you probably wouldn't. Never did, never did. I mean, I was going to resorts and to Canada fishing when I was six and seven and eight years old. It was quite something. Lucky, lucky. Yes, my dad would buy a new car and off to Texas we would go the next morning. <laughs> no, he was quite a manager. I, I uh, can't say enough good about my lifestyle as a child. It was delightful.